All right. So uh, thank you for inviting me, first of all. Um, it's been a pleasure to, and an honor to, to have the opportunity to talk to you. And, and, and I, I just suspect that maybe one of the reasons why you invited me is that many, many winters ago, I uh, decided to publish a silly little paper in which I presented um, a questionnaire or a number of questionnaires, which, which I called Godspeed Questionnaire Series. And um, it's not a particularly good paper. Fundamentally, it is just a paper where I wrote down, hey, look, these are the questionnaires that I used in my work. Maybe this is useful for you. And that's all I ever did. And uh, so my contribution was actually, in a way, quite minimal. Um, and what made this a whole success is actually the contributions of the community. So a lot of people started to use it. And if that happens, then you start to have some form of standard or standardization of a, of a measurement tool, which is great because then you can start to compare things. So you can compare um, how your robot is perceived versus mine, because at least the measurement tool is the same. And that, I guess, is a, to some degree a step forward, but that's not my contribution, that's your contribution. And the only thing I did is um, actually collect all the translations that came back. So a lot of people started to translate this into other languages. And just last week, I did the effort and uh, actually made a proper spreadsheet on this. So um, you see a spreadsheet there now with the uh, different languages and the people who are responsible for uh, translating this. So if you do have a translation of this, uh, even if it's already in, in, in a language that exists, if your translation is different, uh, just send it to me. And we also have a column where we can we where we acknowledge the author. And if you have a paper with that, we link the paper. And so this will help other people um, do their work, um, I hope. So it's a community effort, really. Now, when I, you asked me to talk about this particular topic, then it's about methodology. And, and recently, um, I had uh, or I recorded uh, a podcast episode uh, with Tony. And so um, I'm running a podcast called Human Robot Interaction. Uh, please have a listen. It is hopefully entertaining, uh, sometimes maybe educational. And uh, I went with Tony through a lot of uh, questions and problems that we encounter in our everyday lives of doing research. And uh, my talk today is, is, is largely based on this conversation with Tony. Um, so yeah, have a listen to that podcast uh, that might be of interest to you. So well, when people start doing an HRI study, um, the first question that I usually ask is, are you trying to solve a problem or are you trying to understand the world? And depending what kind of answer you give me, the study that follows will be, will be quite different. And these are really two very different things where solving a problem comes out of the tradition of engineering, where um, yeah, a person identifies a problem and then tries to find a solution to it. Whereas understanding the world most of the time comes in HRI from the discipline of psychology where we try to understand humans mainly. And to better understand this difference between uh, the scientists and the engineers, um, it is good to draw a diagram. Yes, anything can be explained with a diagram. Uh, so we have here engineers, scientists, and also designers um, that work together in HRI and hopefully harmony. Um, but also there are some barriers. Um, so uh, there are three barriers that, that we identified. Um, and it's just good to know about this to be able to understand each other um, because the worldviews that these people have can be quite different. And sometimes you talk to each other and you think you understand each other, but actually you don't. So therefore it is quite good to have a basic understanding of the different worldviews that people have. So what makes designers different from engineers and scientists is that designers have implicit knowledge. So designers can, for example, create a beautiful robot that looks absolutely amazing or an interaction that is just fluent and elegant and polite. And if you ask them, how, how did you do that? And, 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 and how can we know this and how can we reproduce this? They can't tell you because 
this knowledge that they have on how to do it is inside of them and it cannot be shared. Whereas engineers and scientists, they write mathematical formulas or formal descriptions of what they've done and then it can easily be um, published and also uh, formalized and then reproduced. So if you ask a designer, how did you paint this painting? They would just say, I did. <laughs> so there's this old joke, uh, how to draw a perfect painting. Uh, become perfect yourself and then just draw naturally. Um, when we look at scientists in this particular case, this would be uh, psychologists, um, their, their emphasis is understanding the world. They want to know what is going on and how things work. And, and that is their main goal, understanding. Whereas designers and engineers have an interest in changing the world. So an engineer would uh, see, well, this is not working very well. How can I make this better, right? Whereas a scientist is more interested in, why do people do this, right? And if we look at engineers on how they're different from uh, scientists and designers, um, it would be worthwhile to point out that engineers have typically a focus on technology. They look at the things, whereas scientists and psychologists in particular and designers have an interest in people. Now, these are barriers, and, and it's not that these things are mutually exclusive and you can do only do one thing and not the other. Quite often, you have to do multiple things. So, for example, uh, to solve a problem, uh, sometimes you first have to understand it. Um, so then you do actually start to, with a question like, well, hey, how does this work? And it's a prerequisite for you to solve it. And also, uh, when you understand the world and you come up with some sort of model or theory, then um, uh, nothing is as practical as a good theory. And um, understanding the world in itself can be a problem because um, if, you, if you don't know how it works or what, what's going on in the world and you somehow have to devise a methodology to enable you to understand, so you still have to solve a problem. So these are not exactly polar opposites, but they're still put in quite a different emphasis on, on how on what kind of study you do. So when you are solving a problem, the stereotypical way of doing it would be that you kind of identify uh, an issue um, and you come up with a list of requirements where you say, okay, um, uh, let's say you see the, the problem might be the robot has to go from A to B and it is too slow. Um, and it has to be faster. And then you come up with a requirement. Well, well, if the robot is this fast, then it would be good enough. And then I would have solved my problem. And then you would start getting working on, on building a robot, you know, maybe with better motors or more better battery power. And <clears throat> you build the solution. And in the end, you test the solution. So you measure then, like, well, how fast does the robot go now from A to B? And if you meet your requirements, then you can so conclude that, hey, I solved the problem. Um, this is a success. Wonderful. Well done. Uh, understanding the world works differently. There, you start with a question. Um, and that is quite hard. I mean, finding a non-trivial problem is also hard. Um, uh, and also what holds true for both of them, the aspect of novelty. So finding a problem or a question that has not already been asked and that has not already been solved is always, always difficult. Uh, whereas with uh, problem solving, you can always just say, well, you know, okay, the current speed is like this and I just make it faster and faster and faster. And you can sort of like set that up as a challenge for yourself. But of course, at some point it's like, why do we still need it any faster? You know, um, at some points it becomes useless. But anyway, uh, understanding the world. So defining a question is quite hard. And then you need to define a methodology that enables you to answer that question. You run the experiment, analyze the data, and then you have got the answer to your question. Uh, the only way that an experiment will ever fail is if you are unable to answer the question, uh, not if you get a negative result. That's not the problem. The problem is if your methodology fails and it just cannot answer your question. 
Now, when we look at <coughs> HRI, um, we have on the one side physics, um, and this is the real science, the real science of engineering, really. And on the other side, we've got the humans and we've got psychology and medicine. Um, uh, well, we should, well, we could say physics and computer science, but computer science is more like math so in its most scientific form. So let's say physics and math on the one side and psychology and medicine on the other side. Those, that is the real science uh, behind everything. And uh, if you wanted to understand anything, uh, well, anything there is to be known about the robot, well, you can just look it up because the technical specifications of the robot are available. So there's no real answer or question you can ask about the robot because you know everything about the robot. So running in a scientific study on a, on a robot is, is pointless because everything there is to be known about the robot you do already know. Um, every line of code is known. Uh, every dimension of it is known. Uh, everything is known about it. Um, now, when you talk about psychology, also a lot of things are known. We know a lot of things about how people work um, and how their psychology works. Psychology has been going on for so many decades that what we know we know a thing or two about how humans work. So what we then have to focus this on is, is the interaction. And I refer to this as the quality, really. And that is what we need to focus on. And uh, one of my uh, colleagues, uh, one cynical, uh, mentioned to me that, you know, if, in this field of study, uh, you either, if you want to be a scientist, you either become a bad engineer or a bad psychologist. Um, well, that was his words. Um, um, I think there's some truth to it because by nature, we have to be multidisciplinary and we can never be fully dedicated to just one thing. Uh, and if we would become, if I would become um, a mathematician, then I think my contributions to HRI would be quite limited. Now, for engineering, then, there's a couple of pitfalls that we, that we usually uh, fall into. One of the things that engineers don't understand is that the success criteria for most HRI experiments is inside of the human. If it is traveling from point A to B and you just measure the time, great, that's a great robotics study and that might be worthwhile in itself. But that's not HRI because there's no human in the loop. So whenever you want to measure success for a robot that interacts with human, the success criteria is inside of the human. How well did the human perform? How happy is the human? How satisfied is the human? That is where the success is measured. And for a lot of engineers, it's difficult because they are known to measure things in the material world outside of the humans. They're not used to measuring humans in any way. So that is usually a bit of a problem for them. Uh, what I also observe very often is that uh, the reverse of uh, problem and solution. So very often it is like, oh, look, we've got this robot and this is the solution. Now let's try to find a problem for this and see where we can apply it. And then you get studies like, well, um, how can we use robots in elderly care, healthcare, this care? I mean, you know the solution, you know what you want to do because you already have the robot, you're building the robot and then you just need to find an excuse of, well, how to justify how this is useful or, or how this can be used. So essentially, it's very often a s solution looking for a problem. And I think this is very problematic. Um, and then very often, this game is really just to extend application areas. So again, you know, you build, continue to build your robots, and you have to continue applying for funding. And then you just keep on looking at, OK, but how can this robot now be used for this group of users? Or how can this robot be used for that application? Um, and uh, very often, actually, robots are not the solution, uh, not at all. Um, and if you're serious about it, like say you want to go after loneliness, robots are not the solution for loneliness. People are the solution for loneliness. And, and people, and then, but that is something that then, yeah, well, your robot would be useless. And then that's nothing you can contribute. So you would run into a problem. So um, yeah, I guess we just have to be more honest to ourselves about what we consider a problem, what is the solution. Another issue is, is comparisons. Um, if you, you know, uh, come up with a technological solution and you find a number about how good the robot is, that's all very nice and good, but it's meaningless unless you can put this number into a context. 
And finding the right context is a problematic. So very often, um, if you compare any kind of performance of a social robot to that of a human, the robot loses all the time. There, there is no social robot that can be better than a human, really. Um, and so therefore, whenever engineers try to compare their robots with humans, they would have to admit that the robot is worse. And therefore, that doesn't look good, does it? So therefore, they try to avoid this like the pest. Um, and what they'd rather do is like, well, let's compare this with most of the time, it's the previous version of the same robot, because it's very difficult to, to get access to somebody else's robot or convince another robotic lab to, hey, you've got robot, can you do the exact same thing? It's very hard to convince people to do that. We're pretty much still working in islands trying to solve our own problems. So very often we just compare it to our previous version or we have a robot, we add a new feature to it, and then we try to measure, well, how much better is it now? But then again, we're still in our own little island and we cannot really compare it to, to the outside world. And, and then, of course, one of the other issues is that we just put up a straw man, like we have developed speech recognition, we switch it on, and otherwise it's switched off. And, and of course, it's better with speech recognition switched on. And it's just, it's a straw man. You just put up this comparison to have it, to show it to that your robot is better. But it's, it's very obvious that it's obvious. So it's not much of a revelation that this really is. Um, but then, of course, that comes to a fundamental problem. It's like if you're a robotic engineer and you build new features, and you build new features, and you're expected to show that your robot has become better and better and better. Well, how do you do that? How do you compare a robot that has a feature compared to a robot that does not have that feature? Right? It's, it's a very kind of difficult comparison. Now, if you do science, if you want to science on, on the human side, it's always, well, there are some other things. Um, um, one of the first thing to consider is that, um, and this is something that a lot of people get wrong, including myself. Usually the first study that anybody does in HRI suffers from this problem, which is complexity. We, we come up with experiments like, oh, we have to consider this variable. And yeah, yeah, we must also consider this aspect. And then you add variables and measurements, and it just becomes so incredibly complex that, yeah, you can measure a lot of things, but interpreting it is so incredibly difficult. Anything that goes beyond a very simple two by two experiment is very, very hard to explain the results. So simplicity really here is, is gold. Um, of course, it doesn't hurt to um, add free observational data. So once you do a study anyway, and let's say you've got a two by two experiment, setting up a couple of cameras and, and record what's going on doesn't really cost you much more in terms of uh, running the experiment. It does cost you something in terms of the analysis. but. Uh, it's usually wise to just keep things rolling um, because unexpected things happen, um, and it just does. Um, and so it is good to have some sort of backup strategies to see, well, if you got very unexpected results, maybe by looking at this other data that you recorded, you still have a chance to make sense out of the whole situation. And the least thing that it's useful for is manipulation checks. So what we do very often is that we set up an experiment like, oh, look, here's a friendly robot, and here's a robot that is not so friendly. And we just design them to be that way, and we pretend that we successfully designed them to be friendly and less friendly. But do we really know this? So we really need to put in a lot of uh, manipulation checks to make sure that what we think that we manipulated, we actually did. It's very, very important. And two other rules of thumb is, only ever measure something that you know how to analyze and that you know how to explain afterwards. And if your experiment comes to a point where participants spend more time answering questions than interacting with a robot, then I would think you're, there's something really wrong with your, with your experiment because then you've got a study on filling in questionnaires and not anymore uh, an experiment on interacting with robots. Another good rule of thumb is write the introduction and your method section before you run the study. Write down the whole thing beginning to that point so that in the end you only have to add the results in the discussion section because that forces you to really think the whole thing through. And then, of course, pre-register your study so that you can no longer be accused of p-hacking, which is a very important thing. Pre-register your study. 
uh, one of the things is that in case you do get a negative result, like you say, you compare this robot to that robot, and you find there's no difference. And of course, you know, uh, there's a strong preference for reporting statistically significant differences. If you have pre-registered it, then you actually have a chance to still get it published. Lab studies versus in the wild studies, another important topic. Um, they both exist. They also have their advantages and disadvantages. In the lab, you can control a lot of things, which is great. Um, let's take the situation of speech recognition. Speech recognition in a noisy environment, like a train station, uh, doesn't work, full stop. So um, if you want to test anything in this area, you must control it. You must get rid of noise. You must do it in the lab. Also, if you're after small effect sizes, things that are subtle, then you probably have to go into a lab because in the wild, there's a lot of noise, a lot of randomness, a lot of unpredictable things. Uh, on the other hand, um, uh, it gives you a lot of ecological validity, meaning that you show the robot in its real environment where it's intended supposed to be. I mean, we don't build robots that are intended to operate only in our laboratories, right? These robots are supposed to be out in the world in the end of the day. So uh, generalizing knowledge that is being gathered from lab studies to what's going on in the wild is limited. But so you have to make a choice, make a wide choice. Quantitative versus qualitative, yes. I have to admit, I'm, a, I'm, I'm quite opinionated on this. Um, very often, qualitative studies are sort of like the ugly duckling uh, of science, and, and I largely agree to that. And I would almost go as far as to say people that use qualitative methods don't understand statistics. And I know that you don't agree with me, or some of you will not agree with me, but, but I, in my practical experience, is a lot of people and students that have no mathematical understanding or very limited understanding of statistics are just scared by the numbers. And they, then they see this, oh, there's qualitative studies, and then I don't have to crunch the numbers, I don't have to do all those nasty statistics, so I'd rather do that. Um, that is very often the, the prime drive. It is not to the drive out of, I mean, there are some real reasons why you want to use qualitative studies, but in my experience, very often that's not it. It's usually just the scare of the numbers. So there are situations, and particularly in the, in the area of ethnography, where qualitative studies is the only thing that you can do. Uh, a colleague of mine was studying the behavior of uh, Orthodox Catholic uh, nuns in Poland and the only way she could ever study this is to join them. She had to go there. She had to go to the monastery. She had to be in there. She had to participate. And that was the only way she would ever gain any knowledge about this group of people, right? And of course, that's qualitative. She's in there and she's participating. She is, as you could say, um, actually corrupting the data because by participating, she's influencing the phenomena. So yes, 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 but that's the only way, that's the only thing you can do. But unless you got some really, really good reasons of why qualitative, um, you should just use quantitative because it is so much more powerful. And if you don't understand statistics, take a course, okay? It's not rocket science, everybody can understand it. Um, it's possible. Autonomy versus Wizard of Oz, yes. Um, we want our robots to do all sorts of amazing things. And quite often, the robots can't. I mean, speech recognition. Yeah, it's supposed to work. But if you run in a study, uh, particularly in a noisy environment, um, the number of participants you lose in the study because speech recognition failed is so high, it just becomes inefficient. So that's when you have somebody in the background with the headphones on listening and pressing buttons. Um, because that's the only way how you get reliable speech recognition to work. And so autonomy, yes, we want that's the final goal. That's where we want to end up with. But until the point where uh, the technology is at a point that is so mature that we can run our studies, very often we have no other choice than to use Wizard of Oz. And of course, of course, this is a deception, right? We deceive people in believing that this robot is actually a super duper robot and can do a lot of these things. And uh, this can be quite problematic. So when in the podcast episode with Tony, he was telling me the story where he was approached by a TV team uh, who was making uh, a TV show about robots in healthcare. 
And Tony said, oh, like, well, that's a great idea. Let's do that. So he programmed a robot to be uh, to run or to conduct an interview uh, with people which were, for example, confronted with a mild form of depression, let's say. And they programmed the robot and they did speech recognition and they did the dialogue tree and, and they did all of these things. And when the camera team came in and said, like, okay, show me what you got, and they showed them what, what they had, the camera team was not satisfied because it took too long. Like, it takes the robot a couple of seconds to recognize, make a decision, come back with a response, then the human says something. It just didn't make good television. So after a bit of forth and back, they settled on um, actually just putting a robot voice over over the whole thing and just edit the whole thing. And the whole thing was broadcasted on television. And the TV crew never revealed that this was all just Wizard of Oz, that this was just a complete fake. And then Tony received phone calls of, of very um, sad and, and desperate people, you know, parents whose children suffer from depression. And they ask, well, where can we please buy this robot? I want to give this to my children because they're suffering. And, and, and Tony had to admit to them, hey, look, I'm sorry, but this was all fake. You know, this wasn't real. And this is a real big problem um, that we very often, particularly when we communicate to the general public, if we pretend that the robot can actually do all of these things, we are lying. And if you write funding proposals to our governments and funding agencies, and we tell all the great things that our robots will do, we're lying because they can't. Another big debate is around physical robot versus screen-based characters. And um, yeah, screen-based characters have become very, very popular, largely around the area that now we have. Um, well, I will come to, to crowdsourcing uh, in a second, but that's probably the main reason why this has become so popular. But really, a physical robot has to deal with the real world. The real world is very noisy, complicated batteries run out, uh, sensors malfunction, so many things that can go wrong. If you've got a character on the screen, everything is known. You know where the character is, what it does. You've got complete control over it. It's so much easier. And um, also cheaper to develop. It's so much easier to do it. And as a matter of fact, these days, you don't even need a screen-based character anymore. When you've got Alexa and Google Assistant, where you've got just voice-based characters, characters, and they can do a lot of things. And you don't actually need to have the robot anymore. Um, so it's become a little bit difficult to justify why well, we're still dealing with robots. And of course, I will come to it in a second as well, why we still do. But this is a real fundamental question. Um, why would you go through all the trouble of building a robot and maintaining it when you can just have a kiosk with a touch screen, right? Um, very often, it works just as well. And guess why the Pepper robot has got a touch screen, right? Because the interaction, particularly voice, doesn't work. So it is just a kiosk with a head. So yeah. Yeah, so crowdsourcing experiments has become very, very popular. And the idea is that running experiments is a lot of work, getting people into the laboratory, paying them, recruiting them, them not showing up, they're making mistakes, losing it. It's just a lot of work. And thanks to Amazon Mechanical Turk and other services, you can create an online questionnaire. You pop images or, or videos of, of robots in there. And you can, within a day's time, you can have hundreds of participants. And this is so easy and so cheap. Yeah, it looks wonderful. Um, also, something's to be said about that um, the sample you take is actually much more varied. So usually lab studies are very often um, college students, right? And that's a very specific type of, of users. So um, in that sense, that there's some plus to it, but it still brings the problem of um, it's not actually acting, interacting with a real robot. It is just interacting with images, and that is not the same as with a robot. And what does help us to avoid is uh, weird HRI, which is Western educated from industrial rich democratic countries, because these are the kind of participants in our studies. And the uh, Amazon Mechanical Turk studies help us to at least go against this a little bit. Coming back to the question of like, why do we still bother with robots anyway when we got voice based agents? And the one reason I can come up with is touch. 
try to tickle yourself. I mean, this actually may be a good exercise right now. Take your hand and try to tickle yourself. Does it work? No, it doesn't. You can't tickle yourself. This is key here. You need somebody else to tickle you. Only then does it work. And so having a robot, another person or another, well, in this case, actually, another, well, it is a thing, but still. Um, so we did a study where we had, we compared, you know, a robot, you know, tickling a person versus a human tickling a person versus a person tickling himself. Touch is really essential. This is the one thing that sets robots apart from screen-based characters and Alexas. They can manipulate the world. They can pick something up and bring it. Um, and they can touch you. And that is this is the main thing. Um, everything else, I guess, I almost wouldn't bother because screen-based characters are better. If everybody's got a phone already anyway, and you can put a character on there, and all the microphone, all the sensors, internet connectivity, cameras, everything is already in here. Why bother with a robot when you can have it already on here? And everybody has this already. Nobody has to buy the robot. It's already here. Hmm? Science versus fiction. Yes. So whenever people come to your lab, and particularly this holds true for crowdsourcing experiments, people have ideas about robots in their mind. And this comes from science fiction, from TV shows, from movies. That is what they, well, this is what they have in their mind when they come to your studies. And that's why it's important to give them a real exposure to a robot, because interacting with a real robot is different than watching a movie. And therefore, this is one of the weaknesses of crowdsourcing, that this impact there is so strong. Of course, still, when you're in a lab, even in a lab story, people come to it with uh, preconceptions. But once they interact with the robot for a little while, they get sort of a real feeling of what it is for, for real. And that changes their real uh, idea about robots. Um, it's to some degree unavoidable that they've got precondition uh, or preconceptions and prejudices about what they think robots are. But when you put them in the robot with a lab, in a lab in a robot, you've got much better chances to, to not just measure science fiction. And of course, the novelty effect. You know, when you bring them to the lab, it's like, oh, a robot, great. Wow, what's going on here? It was so exciting. And that fades away, right? So if you want to do a proper study, you should actually do multiple exposures because this wears off quickly. And, and, and in the end, we don't just, we should not always be interested in just the first impression, you know, just the first thing. It takes so much more effort, more time to, to do it. And if you are extremely, let's say, pragmatic, you say, hey, look, if I want one study with, you know, I can publish a paper. And if I do, you know, three studies, and but it's the same study, I still only get one paper out of it, but it's three times the amount. So why would I do it? If I have got the, you know, if I do the effort, I'd rather do three different experiments and publish three different papers. Yes, you can do that, but your results will by far be not as good. Statistical significance, yes, 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 yes. Uh, one of the things that is happening, of course, um, cynically speaking, you run your study until you find a significant difference. So you keep your statistics running, you know, and you see how close you're, you know, you hopefully see how your p-value decreases. And once you've got enough participants, that your p-value is below the magical 0 0.05, you stop. Wonderful. And then you've got an experiment. Uh, this, 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 this is called uh, the p-value problem. Um, and um, the question is not whether differences are significant, um, um, but whether it is an interesting difference. Because giving a large enough sample size, everything becomes statistically significant. So unless you have some form of um, um, indicator for the effect size, p-values by themselves are almost meaningless. So here's an example of p-hacking. Here they had a really, really large data set. And they could correlate anything to anything. So raw tomato, eating or drinking raw tomatoes was linked to Judaism. Egg rolls were linked to dog ownership. Uh, energy drinks was linked to smoking. Potato chips was uh, linked to higher scores on SAT. So anything becomes significant or correlated to anything if just your sample size is big enough. And without an effect size, um, this is pretty pointless. 
And of course, you know, sometimes this weird stuff happens. Here's the correlation between the number of people who uh, uh, per capita cheese consumption is uh, significantly correlated with the number of people who died by becoming tangled in their bed sheets. This correlation is significant. Does it matter? No, it doesn't. It's 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 just nonsense. So that's why p values you have to be careful about it. And as I mentioned before, like it is so much easier to publish a study that has shows a significant difference, and um, um, and and this actually introduces a bias in what type of literature is being published. And this is a real problem because everything that doesn't work just gets put in a file drawer. If, you know, it never sees the light of day. So if you do pre-register your studies, then you can also publish studies that show that there was no significant difference, right? So please pre-register and then also study this. The replication crisis um, is, of course, another big issue, and the HRI conference made some progress on this. It's nice that you do a study, but unless somebody else can replicate it, um, the evidence you pre present is not as strong as it should be. And we've seen this before that a large number of studies cannot be replicated. And, and also replication studies are just not sexy. Like it's like you take somebody else's work and you re replicate it. You know, um, it doesn't score high on originality, right? So therefore they're, they're not just, just not that popular, but they're necessary because otherwise we build up all these ideas on, on studies that in the end cannot be replicated, which is a real problem. So I hope that this gives you some sort of insights. Um, uh, these are ideas that Tony and I had about uh, research methodology that are largely based on our experiences of making many, 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 far too many mistakes in our own studies and having far too many of our papers rejected for stupid reasons. Um, and I hope that this helps you to reduce the number of papers that you get rejected, but also helps you to create better papers and that encourages you to publish studies that are also with non-significant results. And with that, I think I would like to thank you. And um, um, yeah, I am open to questions. Thank you so much for your talk, Dr. Bartnick. Uh, that was great. Um, I might actually require all of my students from now on to, to watch that talk before they do any HRI work. Um, what do you think we can do to make replication studies more sexy? How can we promote within the community performing actual replication studies? Do you have any ideas on that? Well, to my knowledge, the HRI conference started to have a dedicated track for it. Um, that is, I think, um, the first step forward. Um, uh, well, look, you're not going to win a Nobel Prize for a replication study, right? <laughs> Full stop. Um, so we have such a strong value on originality. Like you are the one who found out this and you are the one who found that and you are the one who created this algorithm or that algorithm. You know, originality is so important. And I don't think that's really going to go away. Um, well, one thing, I mean, one thing that I recently observed when I was collaborating with a colleague of mine in, uh, he's in sociology <clears throat> and we were, we were doing a study together in HRI and we did an experiment and, uh, and I was like, okay, let's publish it. And he was like, hey, wait a minute, that's just one study. I was like, yeah, sure, it's just one study, that's okay. And he's like, no, it's not okay. When I publish a study in sociology, I have to show 10 experiments that all show the same thing. And only then would this be considered for publication. So there's a lot of differences uh, across the disciplines. And so moving away from this salami uh, method of you know, uh, turning anything into the least publishable unit and pumping out as many papers as possible, moving away from that and moving towards, well, let's do the best possible paper, I think would, would be a way forward. And, and one way to accomplish that in my view, and I wrote a paper about it some time ago, it's called the all-in publication policy, uh, policy, is that we should just accept every paper. Every paper submitted should just be accepted because then 
it no longer becomes a goal to publish many papers because that's insignificant. It doesn't matter anymore. And the only thing that matters is like, well, how good are your papers, right? And I think you mentioned this in your podcast about the same subject, but you say, I think you say that every paper will get published eventually, right? They're just going to put it through a different venue. They're going to find some journal that might be of less quality, but it is going to get published no matter if you reject it or not. Um, and I think that's a really good point that just publishing everything might be a, a good idea. But I, at the same time, how do we control for quality in that scenario? How do we ensure that um, things that do get published, like do we just qualify that this will get published if you if you do these edits or, or what do you think the process should be for that? Well, there are some, there are some ways, so some new methods of doing it. But um, I actually did a study once where I compared all the papers that were published at HRI and I compared that to all the papers that were rejected from HRI conference. And when we just a couple of years later, we checked, like, well, you know, were the HRI papers better than the papers that were rejected? Because of course, those rejected papers did get published somewhere else. And the answer was like, no, not really, not so much. Um, so in that sense, um, it is just a sorting mechanism, not a filtering mechanism. Um, some journals, like Plus One, for example, um, they publish the complete peer review communication with the paper. Um, so that's something. You can attach the name of the reviewers with the paper. And of course, then you'll be quite concerned about your reputation because if you accept a paper, which turns out to be too complete rubbish, and your name is associated to it, yeah, you better be careful. So yes, there are some ways to go about it. Um, Yeah, I fear the day that my reviews will be published, but I guess I have to be a little bit nicer now. Um, <laughs> I guess I'll, I, I'll open the floor up for other questions. I'm not going to hog you all to myself. Come on, don't be shy. Uh, yeah, questions? so um, great talk. It was very interesting. Um, there was a bit of a kind of uh, how you say, like an elephant in the room um, with academic uh, publishing uh, known as tenure um, mm -hmm. process, uh, unfortunately. Um, so for instance, in the North American tenure system, you know, there's a very big push to publish, fund, maybe go on the hot field, you know, not the one that actually solves problems. Um, and, you know, it's it's not something that, you know, we can just solve overnight, right? It's a systematic change. Um, you know, people who review uh, proposals, right, are the ones who are part of a system that has very, you know, high pressure to publish. So where do you think that maybe we should start? Because what could happen is that if we instill what you, you know, these very valuable topics that you discuss in students, right, and then those students become, you know, the reviewers, right, and then enforce that standard, Right. That could be one way, you know, because it's really the system that's, you know, producing this uh, some of this type of work, um, you know, and it's rewarding or punishing people accordingly. Right. Um, so I'm just curious, you know, how do you see that type of institutional change? Science progresses with the death of its professors. So to some degree, we just have to sit it out. Um, um, the other thing to consider is that there are the one, the one thing where you have a choice to influence the system is you decide where to publish, right? And so there are quite a number of innovative ideas, innovative journals with different perspectives. So just don't send your paper to, for example, that, that be the HRI conference or something. You know, you just you, you this is the one thing you can select is where do you submit it, right? And and I think that's a very important thing. And for example, the HRI conference, for years we had debate around um, acceptance rates, right? Because as a matter of fact, so many good papers get rejected. I had suppose, I think was this year, last year, I'm not quite sure. I had a paper that got four reviews and it was four, 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 four. You know, it was 
uniquely, I mean, it was consistently recommended for recommend, recommend for, for publication. And then after the, uh, after the meeting, it was rejected. Why is that? I mean, it's completely silly. So, um, and, and one of the reasons is that <clears throat> it's given is like, yeah, in the North American system, um, the acceptance rate has to be low, has to be below 25%. Other does, otherwise doesn't count for the, uh, for the committees for promotion. Okay. But how stupid is that? Because there are, if you have so many more good papers, you know, just for the sake of this stupid percentage, you reject good papers. I mean, that is just ridiculous. Right. And yeah, so I'm not happy about it. Yeah. I mean, yes, there are trash papers, obviously, you know, not everything that's written is great. And sometimes things just are wrong or full of mistakes, you know, and yes, we can usually easily identify them. But, and then sometimes there are some really top papers and you can also re reasonably easily agree on it. And then there's this big gray field in the middle, which is, it's okay, you know, not great, but it's okay, you know, and this is where the real problem is. And, and, and I think if you are too selective, what you breed is a form of conservatism, right? Unless you got the perfect statistics, unless you've got, you know, everything is expected of you, you know, you're not just going to make it as, as soon as you got some, some novelty, something weird, something, you know, out of the ordinary, you're not going to make it, you know, because only the papers that are like the role model that comply to all the conventions that really nobody can come up with an argument about saying like, oh, this is not good. You know, you win. Unless you've got a five, 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 five evaluation, you're just not going to make it. So, yeah. So in that sense, I'm becoming less and less a fan of the HRI conference because it is becoming so conservative. Thank you. It looks like we have a question in the chat. Um, yeah. And it has said, very often in A-B testing, we tend to design the metrics and experimentation that conveniently gives our method the edge. It's surprising how many times we do this unconsciously. Any tips on how we can avoid that? Mm. Kill your babies. Yeah. Um, look, we all build system and we put so much energy into them. And of course, we want them to succeed, right? And having to admit to ourselves that what we've done is not as good or bad is very, very painful. Um, and therefore, very often we set it up in itself. I mean, I had once had a PhD student who flat out refused to compare her system to another, to the, let's say, golden industry standard uh, with the argument, why would I set myself up to failure? <laughs> and, and if you do that, then in my view, you automatically disqualify yourself from science. Because if your ego is more important than the truth, then you shouldn't be here. Um, so in that sense, be committed to truth and um, be aware that it is not about you. It's about knowledge and it's not about you, full stop. And if you are committed to truth, I think only then do you actually get to interesting results. Um, if you're just interested in shining and having a big ego, yeah, you might get promoted. It definitely helps in getting promoted. But so what? You earn more money. But is that going to make this world a better place? Uh, I'm not so sure. <laughs> Life lessons. Well, yeah, I'm not so sure. <laughs> I wouldn't go as far. <laughs> don't do as I do, you know, <laughs> don't do as I do. And not to plug your podcast too much, but there is an episode that uh, in Dr. Bartnett's podcast uh, about what researchers would tell their former selves uh, in their career. And that might be a good, a good place to look as well if you're looking for advice on that. I mean, we all grow. Um, um, and when we're young and we start, we're quite idealistic and we're free and we don't have any family ties and mortgages and all sorts of other things. And things change over life. So you get different perspectives over life and, and all of them are necessary. I mean, if you're young and full and energetic and, and, and you still got the energy to actually do something. So that's great. And we need that. Um, that's why 
practically speaking, most of science is actually done by PhD students. I mean, that's that's just the truth. Um, and here in New Zealand, where I live, PhD students don't even earn a minimum wage. So, yeah. Sadly, it's like that in the United States as well. Well, there you go. It's, <laughs> um, it's if you think about it, um, these days, when, when we want to hire new staff in our my university, we, we, we very often have to point to external funding, right? So if we say, hey, we need somebody, and they'll say like, okay, do you got the money for it? And we say like, oh yeah, we got this five-year project, you know, on this and that. And they said, okay, you can, you can hire a person for five years. And that's it. And so we get this increasingly big bubble of people being caught up in, in fixed term contracts, um, which is just brutal and, and, and really, really a bad idea. And so, um, but that's all tied into how universities are funded uh, because everything becomes competitive. Research only ever gets done if it is done, done through, um, uh, let's say, competitive fund. I mean, does your university have an internal fund where you can go, hey, I want to do a research project. I need $50,000, $100,000. Can you please give it to me? No university does that anymore. They, they say like, okay, you can do a bit of teaching and we pay you and you give you a salary. But if you want to do some research, go somewhere else. <laughs> So universities are no longer interested in actually doing research. I mean, that's that's sad. Ah, I'm getting too cynical here. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's interesting how all of that ties back into the structural problems within the community. Like it, it's all part of a larger system that needs some reforms for it to make impact towards. Uh, progress in science and sort of ending the replication crisis. Because if you don't feel pressured to get tenure and publish a bunch of papers, you're going to publish higher quality papers eventually, rather than a bunch of smaller, less impactful papers. Um, so I, I don't know that there's any one way that we can fix the system, but I know that there's maybe smaller structural changes that we can make within our organizations to, to push for a little bit of harm reduction um, as best we can. I don't know about total reform, but um, I'm sure well, it's, go and it's talk to, cool. Go and talk to like the really old guys, guys that are about people who are about to retire, like if they're in their late 60s and you ask them, hey, what was it like when you were young? It's shocking. <laughs> it's shocking how the situation that they had um, when they were young compared to now. I mean, yeah. Um, it is uh, problematic, and uh, I can only say to all of you, I wish you all the best luck. I I'm not sure if I can recommend a career in academia. <laughs> it's not necessarily the healthiest place to be. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, as a matter of fact, uh, there were statistics on uh, from the UK, and they had a from all the pe people who do a PhD, how many of them end up with a permanent position in academia? It was around 3%. And how many actually make it to professor, which I think was 0.01%. So that was, then, that was data from the UK. And everybody else had to go somewhere else because there was just no other option. So, I mean, if you think it through, I only have to create one PhD, and that's the person who replaces me. And I have already graduated, I don't know, 10, 20 right? <laughs> it's not sustainable. I mean, not sustainable in the sense that it's not just for academia. You could say like, yes, yeah, but industry will also benefit from having people who are highly educated. Yes, that's true. And as a matter of fact, we just have to face the reality that most PhD students will not be in academia, full stop. That's just, that's just how it's going to be. And in New Zealand, there is no robotics company in New Zealand. So if I would lose my job, I don't know where I would go. <laughs> yeah. Do we have any more questions for Dr. Bartnick?
not a question, but I would definitely really and sincerely with the bottom of my heart, thank you for coming and presenting today. That was a fantastic presentation. Thank you so very much. My pleasure. It's my pleasure. All right, guys, then have a wonderful workshop and um, all the best. And uh, yeah, I have to chop some firewood now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Bye, Bye. Bye. <laughs>